uh, spiritual gifts, and I wanted to look at it from a, a fresh perspective as we are going to be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, and we started with the chapter that's in the middle, chapter 13, the love chapter. We hear it at weddings, and uh, I suppose it's okay to do it at weddings, but that really isn't what it means, that kind of love. It's speaking about the love that we have for one another in the church, and that anything that God gives us as gifts or enablements is for the purpose of blessing one another and working together. Uh, the church is called the body of Christ for a good reason. We are the representation of Jesus on earth. I hope you get that. Amen. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. That's the way it's supposed to be. And I know that we're human and we make mistakes. Some people stay away from church because of a bad experience they had in church, and they don't never get past that and don't realize that that wasn't God. That was just one of his children having a rough time. And we've all been there. We've all fallen short. We've all said and done things that are really stupid in hindsight. Uh, but isn't it incredible that God established this organization, this institution called the church? And then he said, okay, you run it. And he say, of course we're going to make mistakes. Of course we're going to fall short. But that's not the goal. The goal is, is to ever be more and more like Jesus, right? That's the sanctified life. It, you never arrive. It's an ongoing process. That's why in, in church life here, we never want to just kind of settle into a rut because that rut gets comfortable and comfort brings complacency and complacency brings ineffectiveness. If you're complacent, you bear no fruit. If you're challenged to grow and we get to a point where you say, I have to trust God. I have to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Then we're finally in a position where God can fill us and use us. This is the way the church is designed to be. Over the centuries, it's taken lots of detours, hasn't it? You can read your church history where men and women have gotten the big head and they've tried to have too much power. Instead of leading people, they've lorded it over people. We've heard all of the awful stories. But the New Testament church is about God choosing to invest himself in the person of his Holy Spirit into all believers. And then in turn, those believers uh, are able and equipped to do what he's asking them to do. It's pretty much the church in a nutshell. We've complicated it. We've made it all kinds of things. But I believe it's time, and I think we're seeing in our time around the world where people are getting a hold of this, and they're stripping off all the junk all the stuff, all the extras. Nothing sinful about the extras, but we got to get back to the real reason we exist, Amen. and that is to lead people to Jesus and to worship Him. Uh, lots of other things, of course, fall under the umbrella of that, but those are the basic things. So, when we've been looking at this and eventually going to get into the manifestation spiritual gifts, in 1 Corinthians 12, but I, I want us to have a different approach and a different viewpoint. So, three weeks ago, one, two, three, three weeks ago, I said that it's all about love. So, when we looked at 1 Corinthians 13, it was all about love. You know, if, if I have all of these gifts and yet I have not love, it's worthless. If I've been used in the most supernatural gifts you can imagine, and yet my heart is wrong toward a brother or sister. It's just a bunch of noise. And I don't want to make a bunch of noise. Do you? I don't want to make a bunch of noise. I, I want us to be fruitful. So that first week was saying that it's all about love. The, the, the reason that we do what we do is love for one another, love for God, and love for other people. And this week, I want, to, I want to just take, I'm going to take three verses of Scripture out of the, the beginning of 1 Corinthians 12. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them. Uh, I'm going to be using the ESV this morning, but uh, whatever flavor you may have.
But the whole focus on these first three verses is we're going to talk about the way of the Spirit, the way that God chooses to operate by His Holy Spirit. We live in a, in a physical world where things are tangible. We, we want to be able to, to get a hold of something, right? We, we stand on solid ground. There's physical gravity. There's all of the physical things that are in place. And we sometimes look at that as reality. And we talk about things like the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit or about spiritual things. And, and somehow it's this ethereal concept that we can't really make concrete in our minds. Where I would like to propose to you that the way of the Spirit is more real than the way of the flesh and the way of the physical. And if we're going to understand spiritual gifts and their role in the church and, and what they are and try to get away from all the confusion and, and the, the stuff that doesn't even even biblical about some of these gifts, I think we have to understand that we have to be in the way of the Spirit and understand the way of the Spirit. Now, when I say the Spirit, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. I know that the world isn't always talking about the Holy Spirit when we hear Spirit, right? There, there are spirits, and they're not all of God, and we are to test those spirits to see if they're of God. We can get confused and test the people instead of testing the spirits, and then we get judgmental, and then we get fights and all that kind of garbage. We don't want that. So we've got to understand the way of the Spirit. And the, the one thing that I can, I can say, not say enough, is that God wants you to experience Him in deeper ways tomorrow than you did today. That God wants to equip you. That it's His nature and it's His heart to give to you so that you can be a blessing to others. Let us never think that we have to beg God for this stuff. Did you beg God to be saved? Did you say, oh God, please make a way that I can be saved. I, please do something. I don't know how I'm ever going to do it. Well, that's stupid because Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. And we talk about finished work of the cross. We don't have to beg God. We can just simply come to Him and say, I <laughs> repent of my sin. I, I, I want to be a different person. I, I'm going to, I want to be born again. I want to be changed. And, and aside from maybe the way our mind has changed and maybe some of the things that we used to want to do, we lose that desire. We don't have anything like concrete that we can put our hands on that we can say, oh, here's, here's a certificate of my salvation. But we know by faith. And then someday when we see him face to face and we won't need faith anymore, we will have the full assurance of our salvation. But it all started with our decision to trust God in what he's already done. So why do we think we have to beg God for these spiritual gifts, for the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that, that work following salvation that he has intended for all believers in Jesus Christ? And, and that we, should, we could stop making benchmarks and and, and making it mechanical and saying, well, this is such a date, uh, this happens, so, so now I'm done with that. And now this, no, the way of the Spirit isn't like that. The way of the Spirit is ongoing. The way of the Spirit does not follow earthly chronology. The way of the Spirit does not follow earthly hierarchy. And we'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, I'd like to read these three verses here. So this is 1 Corinthians 12. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. New believers grew up in a pagan atmosphere, right? Uh, this is brand new to most of them. Some of them are Jewish converts to Christianity. Some of them came from, from pagan uh, background. So, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus the Lord is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, 
I mentioned this three weeks ago. I'm sure you remember everything I said three weeks ago. But I mentioned it three weeks ago that the, the phrase gifts, the word gifts is really not in the Greek. Uh, it's actually, if we were to translate it literally, Paul would be saying, now concerning spirituals. Pneumatikos is the Greek word. It just means spirit, pneuma, where we get, you know, like pneumatic air pressure and all of that. So when he's saying spiritual gifts, it's spiritual things. And we think of gifts, and it's a good term, right? It's a good word. But I think sometimes we can try to equate that to a physical thing, a gift, like a thing. When really what Paul is saying, regarding the way of the Spirit, I don't want you to misunderstand. So if, if Paul didn't want the Christians in Rome to misunderstand in the 50s A.D., I'm pretty sure God doesn't want us to misunderstand the way of the Spirit in 2024. When he says, uh, this translation says brothers, uh, brethren, it means the family of believers. That's men, women, boys, girls, all who are born again. So that includes every single child of God. You're a child of God if you've accepted Jesus Christ, right? If you're following Jesus. So this is for everybody. Why would it be different today than it was then? If you're a child of God, you're a child of God. What is time by heaven's viewpoint, right? So this is for everybody. This is for all believers to get a hold of. He says, I do not want you to be uninformed. King James says, I don't want you to be ignorant. We don't like that word anymore. But purely it means I don't want you to not know and to live your life not knowing. Because when you try to go forward not knowing the basics, then you get everything all mixed up. And then we have misunderstandings. And you have fights and quarrels and all the things that, unfortunately, some people identify with church life. He says, when you were pagan, I think it's interesting that the word there is ethnos. We get ethnic from that. And he's not speaking of, he doesn't, he's speaking negatively of people of different ethnicities. He's just saying, those of you who were not Jewish, those of you who did not understand who the one true God is. Uh, you were pagans. That, in other words, way back before you came to Christ, right? So a lot of it, ethnos, has to do with identity. We talk a lot about uh, I identify in Christ, right? I don't identify by my weakness. I don't identify by what I used to be. I don't identify by my shortcomings. People have a lot of problem with identity today. And because they're... they're they're, they're lost. They're looking for a place to put identity, so they put it in all these superficial things. And if they don't like that, they just decide that there'll be something else. And it's really unfortunate because the true identity is in Jesus Christ. But I think it's interesting with people, when you were once pagans, they identified as Greek, they identified as Roman, they identified in all these different nations. And what's beautiful about it is that in Christ... None of that matters anymore, right? Slave or free, uh, Jew or Greek, male or female, all of these things, it doesn't really matter. And uh, I find it interesting that if I went to France to visit, they would not call me a Frenchman. If I went to West Virginia to visit, I would not be a West Virginian. But under Christ, I'm a Christian. Because all, all that other stuff drops off. So he's saying, listen, back then when you were pagans, you were, you were led astray. And you were led astray to mute idols. Saying that these idols couldn't say one thing. They had no brain. They had nothing. There was nothing about these idols that was evil or holy. But what led them to those idols, now that's a different story. We're all led. Everybody is led. A lot of people don't like to think they're led, but everybody is led. Everybody is led by something or someone. Uh, when you see a, peop a group of people that live in a very tight-knit community, whether that's a small rural town or a big city, you find that they tend to think more alike. 
whereas you have people that are sparsely populated, they tend maybe to think some things through. Well, the same could be said for an, an ethnic group or people of a different nation or people under a culture, for example, a pagan culture in Corinth that would have been uh, uh, the, the Roman gods and goddesses, right? The mythology of the ancient world. And they would have been led astray. The idols that they worshiped themselves weren't evil, but the spirit that led them there was. So any spirit that's not for God is against God. Amen. So we have to understand the way of the spirit. There are battles being waged and fought in places we cannot even see. But the bottom line is, is that the important battles were already won when Christ hung on the cross 2,000 years ago. Amen. We do not have to live our lives in constant fear of falling for the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing or being led uh, the wrong way because if we're living in the way of the Spirit, we can be led by the Spirit of God. The rest of the world can do what it wants, and that's what's frustrating for us because we see a world that's increasingly secular. You saw what happened to the opening day of the Olympics and that travesty. But you see, to those people, that wasn't as offensive. And it was, it was that country that is 99% secular that to them it was just something funny to do. And it breaks our hearts, right? But we don't have to be led by that. Right? No one can make you do those things. You have the ability to do what is right because we're in the way of the Holy Spirit and He is leading us. But Paul says, when you are pagans, you were led astray to these mute idols, these worthless uh, idols of wood and stone. And he says, however you were led. In other words, however you got there, whether it was just simply the, 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 the evil in the human heart that all human beings have fallen from God, all human beings were created by God, but over time, there's this, this, this distance that grows between God and man. Whether you let, were led there by your own will, or whether your culture led you there, or whether a demonic spirit led you there. Paul said, however you were led. And he didn't write this, but I'd like to think he was saying, doesn't matter how you got there. That's immaterial. Doesn't matter how you got there. Because, you know, at, at the cross, it, it all starts fresh and new. There, people come to the cross from many different directions, but from that point on, there's one way. Amen. So what Paul wants them to do, and he goes on to say, I want you to understand, and we can infer here very safely, knowing the character and nature of God, is that if Paul wants them to understand it, so does God. God wants them to understand this, and that's more important than just Paul wanting them to understand he is not trying to form a group of Paul followers. Right. He's leading a group of Christ followers. Yeah. We're not leading a group of pastor followers or personality followers. We're following Jesus. Yeah. When people think of this church, they should think of Jesus. Yeah. If there's a face on this church, it's Jesus. Yeah. I want you to understand, and, and here's the beauty of all this, and I I, I spoke to this earlier. In God's economy, in God's system, it's not a hierarchy. There's authority, but it's not hierarchy. And when we apply that to the gifts, we have to understand that. That the more dramatic manifestation gifts are not better. The the ones that get the press are not better. They're not worse either. There is an authority in the church, but not a hierarchy. See, a hierarchy says that the person at the top uses the people underneath to build them up. Amen. So the person at the top of the hierarchy calls those down below to serve them. But in a system of authority in the church, the person at the top serves the rest. And this is the way it should work in the church. If, if one has a, one gift and one has another, it should be complementary, but all should serve. All should serve. 
We do not take gifts of the Holy Spirit and put them on our shelves and go, yep, I remember back then, and, you know, get all, yeah. My friend, uh, Randy Simpson, some of you know him. He's a singer, gospel singer. He does a character called Uncle Buford, and it's a riot. I died. I'll, I just couldn't breathe one time. He was doing this for me. Uncle Buford is the guy who's the first one to do everything. He's the expert on life. Anything you could talk about, he's been there, he's done it. And Randy does his whole character. I can't do it like he does. But he says, everybody has an Uncle Buford. Well, sometimes Uncle Buford goes to church. Uh, but that's not the way of the Spirit. Not the way of the Spirit. He says, no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. And no one who is in the way of the Spirit, operating by the Spirit of God, can say Jesus is a curse. You know, talk, talk is cheap, right? But what he's saying here is this kind of talk isn't cheap. You can't just say something. You can't just declare something to be true just because it comes out of your lips. And you might say, well, I don't know about that. I hear a lot of people that say things, and, you know, not that politics has come to mind, but I hear, you know, what's, what's that one somebody said one time? How do you tell if a politician is lying if his lips are moving? You know. But, I you know, we won't get on. We won't go down that trail. But uh, here's what it means. It means no one can... In, in the Spirit can affirm that Jesus is Lord and mean it from their heart. And, and no one can say Jesus is Lord and affirm that except by the Holy Spirit. You know, we talked about being led, that they were being led. See, that's the difference. Someone can tell you to say the words Jesus is Lord, but only your heart can tell you to affirm the fact that Jesus is Lord. Huh? And if the Holy Spirit is leading you, there's no way you can say Jesus is cursed. However, if the Spirit of the world is leading you, you can say Jesus is cursed. So when we see things like happened over in France with uh, the Olympics, we, we can look at what they did in that display of uh, making mocking that painting. Some people say, oh, it's just about artwork. No, it was... A definite attack on Christianity the way they did it. But, but no one can do that and have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them, right? So this is a good litmus test for us. When we're, when we're exploring the deeper things of God and we're walking in the Spirit and we're talking about spiritual gifts and what they really mean, the heart makes all the difference. The heart makes all the difference. And the reason Paul was writing this to the church in Corinth is, that, is not that they were not operating in these gifts. They were. And, and by the way, these nine gifts here, I don't think that's an exhaustive list. I think it's Paul saying, uh, you know, for example, you have this and you have this and this. doesn't mean there aren't more. We've made too much of a deal sometimes about focusing on identifying and categorizing and subsets and just stop it. Stay in the way of the Spirit. Let him do what he wants to do. The Corinthians were having trouble because they were excited because they were being used in these gifts, but yet there were other areas of their lives that were not lining up, and that's why he wrote this letter. He did not write this letter to say, hey, people are telling you these gifts don't exist. No, that came later. We do that today. That wasn't an issue then. The issue then was uh, living an unsanctified life and mixing pagan, trying to mix uh, pagan with holy. And that's why he wrote this letter. But we look at it and we can say, well, let's, let's, let's look at it from a different perspective. Let's look at it from the perspective of the way of the Spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 7 that we are to put a test up for false prophets. He said, by their fruits, you will know them. So how do we test the false prophets without judging people? 
can never judge what's going on in somebody's heart. However, we can discern the spirits that are behind, not that we have to name them, but we can discern whether they are from God or whether they're not from God. So if someone is teaching something, and that teaching is either, either their heart, uh, their heart actions that come out in their words or their deeds, uh, if they say one thing and do another, well, then we have to kind of judge that to be false. Amen. Judge is not a dirty word. The spirit of the world tells us that judging is a dirty word. It's not. We, we must judge. We must judge. We must judge what is behind the... The, the spirit that's at work, but we cannot judge motives of a human heart because that we don't know. By their fruits, Jesus said, we'll know them. Yeah. Judge them by their fruits. Oh, a lot of things pass for spiritual in today's world. Uh, how many of you ever talked to somebody? Are you a Christian? Well, I'd like to refer to myself as spiritual. Well, I'm spiritual too, but that could mean a whole lot of different things, right? What a, what a pluralistic society more than ever uh, has crept in that you can call yourself Christian and something else or take a little bit from here and a little bit from there. But you see, ignorance of the word uh, makes that come to pass. There can be no other explanation for those who try to mix things like that that aren't meant to be mixed aside from an ignorance of the Word of God. We cannot be ignorant of the Word of God. We have no excuse to be ignorant of the Word of God. Even if you don't read well, there are audio Bibles. Come on. Right? There's no excuse. So, what, what, is, what do we have to do today? What, are, what is our role to play in all of this? Understanding the way of the Spirit of God, that He wants to freely give us all things, that He wants us to come together, not in a hierarchical sense, but in a cooperative sense in the church to do what he's asked us to do. What are we to be on the lookout for? Well, got a few things here. The first one is this, de detect the evil. There is evil in the world. Yes, there, is. there is evil. Yes. And we tend to make the battles against people, denominations, Nations, uh, politics, party affiliation, uh, language, dialect, all those things. And what we do is we demonize people. Uh, we need to stop doing that Amen. to understand what it is like in the way of the Spirit. But there is evil in the world, and we need to identify it. And there's nothing judgmental or political about identifying evil. Because if we know the way of the Spirit, and we have a good foundation in the Word of God, we should be able to identify uh, the actions of the enemy right away. What is behind the manifestation? These gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, we call the manifestation gift. Why? Because it's when the Holy Spirit, through God's people, manifests himself in a way that can be seen, heard, or experienced. Okay? We know the Holy Spirit is everywhere. We, we can feel his presence and all of that. But these manifestation gifts were different because they were things that could be witnessed, that other people could see. Right? Um, we, we have, on occasion here, we'll have a, a word of prophecy in a service. We'll, we'll have a word of wisdom or knowledge at some time that uh, we'll have a message in, tongue, in, in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and all of these things, a gifts of healing, gifts of faith, all of these things that manifest, right, that God chooses to manifest. Well, there's also manifestations of an evil spirit. Yes. And, and I'm not sure what they all are, but you can tell when it's against God. Amen. So we do have to be on the lookout for these kind of things. What's behind the manifestation? What's behind the person? When, when someone is so angry and so against God, 
we have to understand that there's something behind that. There's a reason for that. There's maybe, maybe a, a series of things that have happened in that person's life, attacks from the enemy. Uh, my goodness, we could go on and on forever. Generational curses that are not broken by Jesus. Things that just grow. And we have to be able to identify that. And it really helps us to separate the person from that because we never want to write somebody off. Amen. Now, there, there are terrible people in the world. There are people who just act in a terrible way, and, and there's hope for all of them. But we kind of have to be careful and identify and not be swayed uh, by people like that. Also, how about movements? There's sometimes evil behind a movement. Well, when something has just bad fruit, just bad fruit, we need to be smart enough to identify that. And when we're raising our kids or leading people in a church, we need to be able to do, have some advising. Listen, listen, this movement is not of God. So we do have to be on guard about these kind of things. But equally, as much as we need to identify evil, we also need to be committed to living holy lives. Amen. Live holy. Do what's right. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to teach your mind what is good and what is not. Teach your mind to listen to the Spirit of God. Ask yourself a question. Why do I want to do that? Is this line of thinking something that is going to glorify God, or do I need to let the Holy Spirit change this line of thinking right now? Is going to this place or... or being part of this group or doing these things, is it really honoring God? Now, there again, we've got to be in the way of the Spirit. We can't always be looking on the outside. You know, the first church of the Pharisees, good at the outside. Clean the outside of the cup, right? And inside is filthy dirty. Yeah. You know, used to be that certain churches, woman, if a woman wore slacks, that was anathema, because she was trying to, she was wearing men's clothing. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world, men wear skirts. You know what I mean? So we, we looked on the outside rather than the inside. But living holy is a matter of your personal decision. I'm going to honor God in all things. I want to I not let sin control my life. We are designed, ladies and gentlemen, by the Spirit of God, to be able to live above sin. We're not going to be perfect in this life. But please stop saying nobody's perfect. Because usually when you say that, you set out to prove it. So we identify evil and we live holy. We make a decision that we're going to honor God. And, and when we mess up and we will recognize it, do what you got to do to make it right if you've hurt somebody else and, and you move on. and You say, I'm going to live holy. And you know, I'll tell you something too. We are more apt to listen to our flesh than to the Spirit when it comes to these things. Any butter? Any butter? Any butter? <laughs> I'm surprised I can talk at all today. Anybody identify with that, have you ever tried to kick something? Whether it's food, or alcohol, or tobacco, or a way of thinking, or a reaction, or unhealthy eating, or all of those kind of things. The flesh usually wins. Because we're not living in the way of the Spirit. Let God change your mind, Romans 12.2 my paraphrase, that God change your mind about the way you think. That's true. Yeah. And that doesn't happen once. That happens over and over and over. Amen. So we live holy. The flesh wants what the flesh wants, but the flesh is not in charge of you. God has redeemed your spirit. Your spirit is in charge of you. Your flesh is not in charge of you. Don't let it convince you that it is. Don't, don't let it lead you, however you were led, to these 
mute idols, idols of flesh, idols of self. Don't believe it. Our spirit and God's spirit is to be in cooperation. It's the way we're designed to live. We're spiritual beings first. You know that? We're spiritual beings first, and then we're mental beings, and we're physical beings. But spiritual, we're first, and that's the part that's going to live forever. And then the third thing we can do is seek to be led by the Holy Spirit. Oh, let yourself get hungry for more of God. Huh? Oh, man. Just, man, I'm just living on, I just, what's next? God, what are you going to teach me next? What are you going to ask me to do next that's so far out of my comfort zone that I don't know how I'm going to do it? What opportunity are you going to place in front of us next? What, what, what person is going to walk in front of my path and you're just going to open a door? What's next? Amen. Right? Yeah. Because if all you worry about is your flesh and your, and your physical life and how you feel and how things look, and you're just never going to understand what it is like in the way of the Spirit. You're not going to have everything perfect Amen. and then go. Just go. Just walk. Seek to be led by the Spirit. Because, you know, ultimately, we're all accountable. Yeah. You're accountable for you. You're accountable for you. I'm accountable for me, between me and God. So we want to seek to be led by the Spirit. When we get into the discussion of these spiritual gifts, and we're taking our time getting there, because I just want us to get the right frame of mind, or frame of spirit, I guess I could say. Don't put limitations on, on God. Don't say, I could never. Don't say, oh, well, I, that's just not Stop it. Don't take an attitude that says, well, if God wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. Well, I hear that far too many times from supposed spirit-filled people. No, no, no. We're not going to seek these gifts to elevate ourselves, but seek the Spirit. Seek God. Seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit telling you, you will never regret it. You'll say, why didn't I do this sooner? Why didn't I just give in on this one area of struggle? Why, why didn't I just say, okay, God, anything you want, yeah. you know? Why didn't I do it sooner? You're going to wait to heaven to experience things of God? Well, this says that that's the icing on the cake. All right, so it's not word for word like that, but there's more time spent in the Word of God about how we live here than there is about how we're going to live there. Yeah. And so many times we've made it more about how we're going to live there than how we live here. I'm just hanging on by the skin of my teeth. Oh, I hope I make it. And that's not the way we're designed to live. That's not the way of the Spirit. That's the way of the flesh. Amen. Blame game will not work before the throne of God. So what do we do with this? And I'm going to ask the team if they would come back. We're going to close shortly with a song of challenge that I hope that you're all going to be able to pray from your heart, you know? We talked about talk being cheap. We talked about no one can say. Well, no one can sing either. But I want you to sing this last song from your heart, meaning what you're saying. We've sung it here many times. But, but what do we do going forward? Well, seek the Holy Spirit. We expect the gifts. There's a difference if we get that backwards. We seek the Holy Spirit. We expect the gifts. We fully expect that God is going to use us in ways beyond anything we've ever thought possible. We anticipate what might happen next without putting him, in, you know, in a structure. Okay, God. Uh, you're going to do this, 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 and this. He goes, <laughs> that's funny, because he very seldom does things that way. But we seek the Holy Spirit. We expect the gifts. You walk in what you know. 
You can't be expected to walk in what you don't know. Walk in what you know. If you know that He's set you free from the power of sin, well, live life like it. If you know that you have an eternal home in heaven someday, well, then live like it, right? If you believe that He is able to to bless us abundantly, far beyond more than we could ask or think, then live like it. And maintain a grateful heart. Huh? Maintain a grateful heart. One of the greatest witnesses of selling food at this stand was the way that we laughed and joked with one another. And we're all dog dead tired and, you know, it's hot and all that kind of stuff. But it's such a good atmosphere there, joking around. Some of it's sarcastic, but we seem to speak sarcasm pretty well. And, and just that cooperative spirit, there was a grateful heart. A lot of people were tired, but they didn't go, oh, I'm so tired. They were like, let's go. Maintain a grateful heart. Be thankful for what he's done for you. Be thankful for what was accomplished on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago that God has designed and said, okay, come on, come on into it, come on. Cultivate personal worship when no one's looking. Get alone with God. Uh, uh, Allow His Spirit and your spirit to communicate, whatever that looks like. The Bible speaks of groanings that cannot be expressed in words. The Bible speaks about praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you for your own personal edification. Maintain an attitude of worship, a time where you set apart. It's one thing to take some time and read the Bible, but if all you're doing is reading some words, put it back together, moving on, you might as well not do it. You need some time to let God speak to you through His Spirit. And then the sanctified life. Can't mix hot and cold together. You just get lukewarm, which is good for nothing. Sanctified life. That means I'm going to commit to doing what honors God in my mind, in my body, and in my spirit. I'm going to have healthy spiritual appetite for healthy spiritual things. This is the way of the spirit. And I believe if we focus more on the way of the Spirit that all the other stuff that we worry about and all the other things that we're concerned about and all the the things on the outside that everyone judges us by, you know what? Let them judge us. Uh, the, The way of the Spirit, the way the Spirit moves, if we operate in that more than we do in the the flesh and the spirit, we'll find that we hear from God and we make better decisions and we make better choices and we live lives that are honoring to God. And as we approach this topic of these manifestation spiritual gifts that can be so divisive and so misunderstood, we come into it with understanding that, first of all, it's all about love. It's about the love that God has for His children that he wants us to be included and to have a key role in reaching other people for Christ, and that it's the way of the Spirit, understanding the character of the Holy Spirit, what it is and what it is not, so that when God moves mightily in our lives and we find ourselves being equipped to do things that we never thought we would, we'll have the right heart attitude, we'll bless other people, and then God blesses us as well.